excellent academic fiesta uh, in the form of webinar uh, by the doc plexus uh, i am dr tejas patel uh, interventional cardiologist at sims hospital in endaba and uh, today with me dr kevu pari uh, will be on chair uh, as a panelist and uh, today there will be two excellent uh, session by dr ralph brandis uh, actually he is the professor of medicine uh, in university of california san francisco in us and he has been awarded uh, 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 many prestigious awards as well as he has more than 400 uh, published manuscripts in various journals so today is going to talk about the future of the medicine uh, and future fate of our uh, fate of medicine uh, or a medical person and uh, dual antiplatelet therapy which is really very interesting in the current scenario so let's go uh, for uh, for the first lecture uh, and then we'll go subsequently second lecture and then there will be the question answer session at the end of the second uh, lecture you can put your questions uh uh on the chat box uh meanwhile the presentation is going on so i'm going to give you a cardiovascular perspective of how clinicians can prepare for their uh, future but in the interest of of our audience response system i came from bhutan right before coming here and so i'm going to ask a question of the audience which of the following is not one of the nine determinants of Bhutan's gross <laughs> national happiness. <laughs> so uh, maybe we start with how that works. So right ahead. Is it psychological well-being, health, education, living standards, wealth, or time use? It turns out that it is wealth is not a determinant of uh, happiness. interestingly and uh, they actually have a big initiative in, in, in evaluating what the non determinants of happiness in Bhutan i was trying to and learn something from them maybe i could become more happy uh, but you can see how it's related to living standards well being health time use education good governance cultural diversity and ecological diversity and living standards uh, is their gross national happiness so What is the issue in 2020? Whether you're a cardiovascular specialist or an internal medicine specialist, when think about 100 years ago, we didn't have antibiotics, we didn't have iPhones, we didn't have TAVR, uh, we didn't have clinical practice guidelines. We were sitting at the bedside, holding our chin, wondering how are we going to make this patient better. Turn forward to 2020. We now have to think about quality, accountability, transparency, and cost. Those are the things that people are asking us at a governmental level, at a hospital level, in the C-suite, in terms of how we deliver care. In the United States, we have learned that unintended variation is stealing healthcare blind. Literally, one third of all dollars spent in healthcare in the United States. is total waste waste and a lot of that waste has to do with unnecessary services when we think about the cycle of clinical uh, therapeutic effectiveness we think of a concept of an idea whether it be a new drug or device we then go forward with clinical trials if the clinical trials show efficacy they get incorporated in our clinical practice guidelines if they're really important the things we must do beta blockers uh uh statins or whatever they actually be incorporated in performance measures we then go out and do the work but to be able to be successful we have to measure what we do when uh, in particularly in registries or outcome reports and that actually determines our outcomes and how we can become more appropriate and more efficient in the demonstration of quality interestingly in this cycle A lot of these things that we have measured can actually lead to new concepts, new ideas, new clinical trials. So that's the cycle of internal of effectiveness. In terms of high quality cardiovascular disease uh, procedures is choosing the right patient for the right decision and the patient preferences, understanding in the context of clinical practice guidelines or appropriate use criteria, 
Then going ahead and doing the procedure correctly, the PCI, looking for the right outcomes, measuring what we're doing, quality metrics, benchmarking, public reporting, incorporating it, for example, in the ACC's uh, cardio, uh, National Cardiovascular Dentistry Data Registry, PCI, and this is really the value equation for cardiovascular disease or procedures. Are we doing the right procedure in the right way with the right out outcome in a timely fashion, looking at appropriateness, processes, and outcomes of care? Another way of looking at it in terms of the real value equation is we want a clinically defined outcome, a patient defined outcome, such as a patient reported metric related to relief of angina, for example, divided by at the cost, and then multiplied by how often we're doing this in the right patient or appropriateness. That probably is the real value equation in the delivery of cardiovascular disease. We have a problem in the United States. I don't know if you have a problem in India, but I guess it's similar. This is a map of California where I'm from. And this is a variation related to angioplasty for patients for non-acute PCI. Why should one area of the country, of, of, the, of, the, of the state, have five times the rate of angioplasty than the mean? Are those patients different? Is there variation of care that is unacceptable? In my uh, strong opinion is that this marked variation, marked variation, shows opportunities for improvement. Now in the United States, I don't know if this is happening here in India, despite all the advances of interventional care, we're being attacked by the payers and the government related to what we do. We actually have an image problem in the United States related to interventional cardiology and doing inappropriate procedures. You may have all heard of Dr. Oz, the TV personality, a cardiovascular surgeon from Columbia. He on his TV show said 50% of all angioplasty is inappropriate. 50%, that's what he's telling the population. Did he get it right? No. We know this because we're actually measuring what we're doing in appropriate, with, related to appropriateness and our National Cardiovascular Data Registry, and it's much lower. It's more like four or 5%. So the ACC actually came up with a document looking at appropriate use criteria to help guide clinicians and also inform payers and purchasers and patients about what we're doing. And the question that I was asked by my interventional college, you're shooting us in the foot. Why are you creating such a document? And the answer is, there is a continuing and reasonable question about what we do. And if we don't create documents like this, someone else is gonna do it for us or to us. And clearly the cardiovascular profession and the medical profession can create such documents better than anyone else. So what are we talking about when we talk about appropriate use criteria? We take the evidence from our randomized clinical trials and registries, expert consensus, we create our clinical practice guidelines. And as I mentioned in that slide of the cycle of clinical therapeutic effectiveness, that determines what uh, performance measures and appropriate use criteria. And the goal here is to increase the use of effective therapies, decrease the use of inappropriate, unnecessary, and harmful therapies to improve patient outcomes and reduce costs in our healthcare delivery system. So what about this appropriate use criteria document? What does it do? So it actually takes, in this case, stable ischemic heart disease. It looks at different indications for the use of uh, patients with potential use of angioplasty. It looks at whether they're asymptomatic or symptomatic. It looks at the amount of anti-anginal therapy that they're on and then determines whether it's appropriate undetermined or rarely appropriate or, or not appropriate to perform PCI in that given population. And we've actually come up with appropriate use criteria tables related to this in a simplistic fashion, green, go light, you can do it, it's appropriate. Yellow, indeterminate, may be appropriate. And R, red light, don't do it, it's rarely appropriate. Again, appreciating individual patient variation can overcome any of these things. So this table happens to look at uh, two vessel uh, disease, 
whether they're on or not on anginal therapy, whether they're asymptomatic or not. And this is to help guide uh, uh, clinicians in their work. But the bottom line, though, is we only can manage what we measure. And how do we actually know if it's appropriate or not unless we're actually measuring what we're doing, benchmarking it, and so forth? So a paper that I was involved in published in JAMA about eight years ago looked at the hospital variation in non-acute PCI inappropriateness. So to put it in perspective, if you have an acute coronary syndrome, 98% of the time that's an appropriate thing to take the patient to the cath lab and perform PCI when appropriate. But in not graph, it shows that in the United States at that time, 12% of PCI for non-acute reasons was inappropriate or rarely appropriate. But maybe even more importantly related to this slide is the marked variation between different hospitals on how well they did in terms of their appropriateness. Some hospitals quite good, but some hospitals doing PCI in patients, you know, half the time that was hardly uh, justifiable. So the next question is, are we professional stewards of our of care? Do we care about what we're doing now that we have these documents, now that we can measure what we're doing? So this paper about a couple years later in 2015, published in JAMA, presented at the AHA, looked at temporal trends related to appropriateness. Now that we have these documents, AUC documents, now that we're measuring appropriateness within the NCDR, and sure enough, Sure enough, in that five-year period, we had a marked improvement with decrease of inappropriateness by greater than 50%, and appropriate PCI uh, increased uh, dramatically. So we are good stewards in general of our healthcare dollars if we have the ability and tools to measure what we're doing and have an understanding of the infrastructure what's appropriate. Nevertheless, despite that temporal improvement, you can see that even in 2014, and that's still true in 2019 and 2020, there's variation among the hospitals in the how well they are and what they can do in terms of appropriateness. Or as I say in administration speak, an opportunity for improvement. So how about stress uh, PCI? I don't know if uh, what the standard of care here is in India, but this is a paper from uh, Dr. Pariks and my friend Pam Douglas. And what she did is she looked at the utilization of stress imaging after PCI from the Medicare database. And what you notice is these are four quartiles of high use to lowest use of um, stress PCI after a PCI. And what you notice, what you notice in that red graph with the highest utilizers of stress PCI is two humps at six months or 12 and 12 months. This is what we call, I don't know if we do this here, the anniversary stress test. In other words, patient's feeling fine, but you go ahead and, well, it's been six months or a year, let's go check things out, do a stress test. Is that clinically indicated? Is there any value related to that? If you look at our clinical practice guidelines, the answer is no. And sure enough, she actually looked at the all-cause mortality, readmission of AMI, repeat revascularization related to these four quartiles, our utilization of stress of stress echo, of stress testing, it did not change the mortality if you did it more often. It did not change the readmission of AMI, but it certainly increased the, uh, the issue of repeat revascularization. Probably no surprise if you look, you do something. We can all improve. We, are, we need to take physicians who are their efficiency and quality is in this low quartile and look at what exemplary conditions are doing and try to move people up into that quartile. It's our professional responsibility. It's the privilege of self-regulation. Although it's onerous, we can do it better than, rather than have it imposed on us by payers. We have projects within the United States looking at such. One is called Smart Care to improve outcomes to improve the bedside application of science, to reduce unnecessary variation. We look at uh, through a number of the ACC tools to see if a stress test is appropriate, whether they need a calf, whether what we should do at the time of the calf, is stenting appropriate, that we look at the quality of the, of the stent. We make sure afterwards they have appropriate cardiovascular risk reduction, 
and overall quality assessment for patient reported outcomes, such as the Seattle question, uh, Angina questionnaire. And this continuous food feedback and quality reports is a way of ensuring high quality care. Smart care decreased imaging that was not appropriate. It decreased PCI that didn't meet a, 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 a criteria. It improved patient quality of life, decreased cost, uh, clearly an appropriate goal. So our take home message here is unnecessary tests and procedures contribute substantially to the high cost of healthcare. <laughs> Value of healthcare is really a value, quality, cost, appropriateness formula. Appropriate use criteria by the ACC have been very effective in minimizing inappropriate tests. It's our responsibility and privilege of self-regulation to be better stewards of our healthcare expenses. And maybe we can, as clinicians, choose wisely in a similar way, or maybe in a portion of similar way of some of the great uh, teachings of uh, Gandhi in terms of his whole uh, uh, wheel of life. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for staying around. I'm gonna talk about uh, a case-based uh, update on the treatment and duration of dual antiplatelet therapy in a patient and therapy with patients with coronary artery disease. Uh, my right. disclosures, uh, I was involved in a couple of the uh, writing groups in terms of the guidelines for uh, ACS and also for the dual update. Uh, dual antiplatelet therapy update in uh, 2016. So we were asked to do case studies. So here's your case study, a 53-year-old Indian male bricklayer, no prior history of coronary artery disease, has three months of exertional chest pain compatible with angina. He underwent a nuclear stress test that showed a decent uh, ventricular function, but moderately severe ischemia interlaterally. He's placed an aspirin, metoprolol, and a statin and his exertional chest pain is substantially decreased, but still present on very marked exertion. So the question for the group is, well, would you do an invasive approach and take him to the cath lab, or would you do a, a, a conservative approach? So just out of interest, how many would take this bricklayer who's doing better, but still with uh, uh, chest pain on marked exertion, take him to the cath lab, raise your hand or increase your metoprolol, raise your hand. All right, most of you would do nothing, evidently. So <laughs> in this case, uh, his uh, cardiologist decided to take him to the uh, cath lab, and uh, the cath at that time showed severe proximal two-vessel disease in the RCA and the obtuse marginal branch of the circumflex. If we actually looked at the appropriate use criteria for stable is ischemic heart disease, where green is it's okay to do, and yellow, it's indeterminate, and red, hell no, don't do that. Uh, this patient fits with this two-vessel disease on one on a beta blockers that it would be appropriate uh, to do uh, PCI, uh, as you would see here. Now, the question now is, what do we really do with these patients? If you looked at uh, a very important study that just came out in uh, in uh, at the AHA in November of the ischemia trial, it actually looked at patients like this who had stable ischemic heart disease with moderately severe ischemia, who by CT we've ruled out left main stenosis, but also diagnosed coronary artery disease. And that showed after a four to five year follow-up that there was no difference as to whether we treated them uh, invasively or non-invasively related to these uh, key outcomes outcomes. Uh, an interesting concept because uh, I would think a lot of our interventional cardiologists haven't reached this equipoise yet, uh, but it is uh, tantalizing to see how this will change therapy. The conclusion of ischemia is that, uh, again, this is the largest trial that we have invasive versus conservative therapy. Overall, if, whether you use uh, an initial invasive therapy compared with median of three and a half years, whether you looked at primary endpoints at secondary endpoints. I will say, however, and, and again, this is very unlikely uh, due to chance that this is a real finding. However, this patient underwent a two-vessel angioplasty, which I suspect a lot of my colleagues in the United States would have done. So the question is, how long should he be prescribed dual antiplatelet therapy in the setting of stable ischemic heart disease? So uh, again, raise your hand if you have an answer here. One month, 
three months, six months, one year, or greater than one year? And so the answer is it could be any of these, uh, depending on a lot of uh, your, your understanding of this person's risk uh, and what type of stent he had or uh, whether he's had a bleeding profile or whatever. This is sort of the conundrum that we have related to dual antiplatelet therapy. So again, we had dual update in 2016. The, uh, that recommendation said in, after patients with a drug-eluting stent, a PDY2 inhibitor therapy should be given with aspirin for at least six months. That's our standard answer. However, in some patients without a bleeding complication who may have significant risks related to ischemic disease, you could do it longer. And patients who have a high risk of bleeding, you can discontinue the PDY12 inhibitor after three months uh, being a reasonable therapy. So what about this issue about prolonged uh, DAP or dual antiplatelet therapy? It's interesting to talk about this because a lot of the recent trials have been talking about shortening the time. But if you look at a couple key trials, Charisma or, uh, or the DAP trial or Pegasus, it, there is some benefit in terms of prolonged uh, DAP therapy in some patients, particularly those with prior myocardial infarction, uh, which you may actually decrease uh, ischemic events over one, uh, one to three percent, but at a cost, of course, of increased uh, bleeding. Uh, and that actually has a 2B indication uh, from the DAP trial, a uh, DAP update. What about the issue of aspirin? Again, the important point here is that the dose of aspirin, uh, which uh, is very important in terms of the risk of bleeding, particularly in the setting of DAP, and we have learned that uh, the sweet spot here is using aspirin between 75 and 150 milligrams. I'm guessing here it's 100 milligram is your pill that you use, or do you use 81, 75? And that's the recommendation, of course, uh, uh, in the United States, typically 81 milligrams in terms of minimizing the risk of bleeding, but obtaining the benefit related to aspirin. In terms of the dual antiplatelet therapy, it's uh, again weighing the ischemic risk with the bleeding risk. Uh, in the United States, we have three uh, uh, antiplatelet uh, uh, PDY12 inhibitors. I will guess, correct me if I'm wrong, that Prasugril is not a player here. You have all three? All three. And, uh, but you can see we have the irreversible as aspects of prasugril and clopidogrel, again, with the prodrugs of those, and ticagalor, which is a reversible active drug. Ticagalor is kind of uh, particularly interesting in the present environment because uh, not only has it been shown beneficial over uh, um, clopidogrel, and particularly related to the PLATO trial in terms of adverse uh, uh adverse car cardiovascular events with a pretty good uh, bleeding and safety profile, although increased bleeding with non-cabbage uh, bleeding, both major and Timmy major, uh, and with uh, mild other uh, safe effects. But the particular excitement that we have with Ticagalor is right now we have developed a, uh, a antidote uh, that works immediately and although we know it's safe, we're still now looking to see whether it's safe and effective. And so that may give Ticagalor an advantage over time because, I needless to say, uh, bleeding on a DAP therapy is a, is a nightmare for all uh, involved. When we look at the end, uh, end STEMI guidelines uh, with uh, ACS, Papitagril or Ticagalor up to 12 months with a, a using a load and maintenance without contraindications is a 1B. If you try to choose between the two inhibitors, it is reasonable, a two-way indication to choose Ticagalor over Clopidogrel and uh, pr uh, Prasugrel over Clopidogrel uh, after a coronary uh, stent implantation if the patient has no history of stroke and, and uh, TIA. Uh, again, looking at our uh, update, our focus update, I put new in quotes because this is the algorithm uh, that was created in uh, 2016. The point being that the new algorithm was if you had a high bleeding risk with uh, ACS, a drug eluting stent, reasonable to stop after six months uh, versus uh, the one year recommendation in general with ACS, uh, 
and again, a 2B indication for long-term utilization after that on high-risk patient, ischemic risk patients. In stable angina, uh, uh, again, six-month recommendation, but three months in patients with uh, high bleeding risk. Uh, a patient population, particularly under-treated um, in my mind, is patients after a coronary artery bypass surgery where uh, recommendations from our guidelines still say that we should uh, utilize dual antiplatelet therapy if the patient had an ACS up to 12 months. A topic that I'm going to spend more time on tomorrow is the, is the is a nasty issue of triple therapy patients who require oral anticoagulants typically for atrial fibrillation and how we manage these patients. Uh, we need to assess their ischemic and bleeding risks. We need to keep the triple therapy as short as possible. Um, uh, in general, we try to choose clopidogrel as the inhibitor of choice because it's a little less potent than some of and Prasigrel and Ticagalor. Obviously, we use the low dose of aspirin. If we're using uh, warfarin, a, a vitamin K antagonist, we shoot for an INR a little lower. And uh, 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 PPI, certainly in a patient with a history of GI bleeding are reasonable, or even at a, in a patients that are uh, at higher risk. One of the challenges we have in trying to figure out length of dual antiplatelet therapy is we look on the left and in terms of increased ischemic risk in patients with stent thrombosis that actually favors longer uh, duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. You can see them uh, on, uh, right there, there. You can scan them yourself versus the patients on the right who have an increased bleeding risk, which favors a shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. And quickly, you would realize that there are a lot of uh, common risk factors for both bleeding and for ischemia that we have to wrestle with in making these uh, decisions. People look at risk scores to try to help in terms of making these decisions. The DAP score was based on the DAP trial. Notice in particular, uh, when one does this, that the patients particularly that have less benefit for longer dura duration of antiplatelet therapy or the elderly or patients over 65, which certainly are a huge proportion of the patients that we actually treat. Underappreciated and not dealt with in a lot of these DAP scores and so forth, it, but what concerns the interventional cardiologist is actually the complexity of the coronary artery disease itself. So if you have a patient who's had triple vessel disease, multiple stents, bifurcation uh, with two stents, long stent lengths, we, can, we know that those patients with complex PCI have a much higher ischemic risk than those patients with non-complex PCI as shown by this trial. And there's recommendations therefore are favoring these complex PCIs with longer dual antiplatelet therapy versus shorter and less complex PCI. Again, something to be making in your decision process. So overall, how, what is my patient's risk of ischemia? That's one of the things we think about. What are my patient's risks of bleeding? What extent are the, will this influence my decision for uh, dual antiplatelet duration? How do I weigh the relative impact of bleeding in ischemic events? In general, I would consider longer DAP in patients with an ACS, renal failure, poor ejection fraction, if the lesions are thrombotic or complex, if, if in your technique you're not using non-compliant balloons or imaging uh, and afterwards to assure uh, good coverage, uh, or if you're using smaller overlapping stents, we should consider short DAP if patients are stable angina, simple lesions, IVUS confirmation, uh, and so forth. And as mentioned, not only is six months recommended, but new studies have been showing safety and efficacy with one to three month duration, particularly in stable ischemic heart disease. Take home messages, patients uh, risk for stent thrombosis versus increased bleeding, and the duration of that will vary with the patient characteristics. Ongoing data for shorter duration adapt and the switch to monotherapy at three months or even maybe one month with newer generations, I think is the way, to, way of the future uh, based on trials such as senior, staff, DAP, smart choice, and twilight where Strategies of using maybe DAP for a month or three months, followed by monotherapy with a PDY12 inhibitor, 
have been shown to be non-inferior or maybe even a scheme, uh, superior, but we don't have enough data yet to fully incorporate them in our, our guidelines. And we have no head-to-head trials in many respects that are not well studied between the three drugs using these uh, shorter duration therapies. So I have to say at this time in the United States, we still need to follow our 2016 guidelines. It is no doubt in my mind that the next focus update of du uh, duration of that will give a more succinct guideline to safe and effective strategy based on a lot of these recent trials and some that are ongoing. And the, certainly in select risk benefit case, uh, ca cases, it may be further uh, appropriate to shorten uh, DAP. And again, thank you for having me in your great city. This is some pictures that we had uh, in uh, touring just two days ago. Thank you very much. Yeah, so there was uh, uh, excellent session uh, by Dr. Brindis. And uh, guys, if you have any questions, you can put the questions on the comment box, uh, on the chat box. So let's start with the questions. I think we have a couple of questions right now. So which clinical characteristics benefit from extended duration of DAPT in SCS patients? So SCS patients, I would say, I think uh, it was one, one of the excellent slides what uh, Dr. Bridges has shown to us. Uh, the patient who have recurrent SES events, like recurrent uh, uh, history of the myocardial infarction in the past, the patients who have SES with the diabetes, the patients who have SES with the uh, CKD, even CKD uh, is again a risk factor for the bleeding as well, but yes, it is a high risk patients and those patients we need to consider DAPT, prolonged DAPT beyond 12 months. Uh, SES patients with the, I would say, uh, uh, highest coronary features like in the angiography, you can see the diffuse disease, diffuse deeper vessel disease, or left main disease. Uh, I would say uh, stent, uh, re stenosis kind of thing, or stent thrombosis kind of thing. These kind of patients require prolonged DAPT beyond the uh, recommended uh, duration. Uh, the next question is what factors should we keep in mind while discussing? the optimal duration of the DAPT. So uh, the same thing what we discussed right now, basically for the DAPT you need to uh, balance between the bleeding risk as well as the ischemia risk. And we have various scoring system as well. But in general, when the bleeding risk is high, you can consider to give the DAPT for the shorter duration and convert them to the single antiplatelet after a certain period of the time, especially after the six months of the time. So at least six months, all of the patients should be given the DAPT but if the ischemia risk is high, uh, the patient who are at more risk for the future events, those patients, we should or we must prolong the DAPT up to the, up to the 12 months or even beyond that. Uh, but the bleeding risk is high, then we should stop the uh, DAPT and convert the patients on the single antiplatelet, preferably ecosprain or the clopidogrel uh, after six months of the time. Okay, so the next question is, uh, how can doctors modify the therapy for patients with the SES? Okay, I think it is we, we don't we don't need to modify any therapy for the SES. There are there are there are always set protocols and the set guidelines uh, which we need to follow in all patients of the SES. Basically, I'll just briefly tell you SES we can divide into three categories. Number one is unstable angina, number two is uh, non-ST elevation MI, and number three is ST elevation MI. So in how to differentiate between these three is that unstable angina troponin will be normal or negative while in case of NSTEMI and the STEMI it will be positive and how to differentiate NSTEMI and STEMI you can see the ECG if the ECG is showing clear cut ST elevation that will be the ST elevation marker infarction if there is a no ST elevation but troponin is positive then it will be a NSTEMI the unstable angina diagnosis is more sort of based on the clinical presentation uh, plus or minus ECG changes. So there are set protocols for all these three acute coronary syndrome situation uh, and how to treat uh, all of them. So we may have uh, uh, a webinar on the management of the SES in the future, but it will be beyond the scope of this discussion right now. Okay, so what are the main advantages and the disadvantages of newer generation stents? 
Uh, I would say disadvantages are very, very low, or I think there is no disadvantage in comparison to the previous generation's time. But yes, advantages are, are there. Number one is less risk of restenosis. What was happening in the previous generation of the stents, the restenosis rate has come down. And number two, the more important thing is the stent thrombosis. And uh, the duration of the DAPT, we can short, uh, we can reduce the duration with the newer generation, a uh, few of the newer generation stents in comparison to the older generation stent. You might have heard about the cypher stent. That was, uh, I think it was the first generation stent. Uh, years ago, it was, I think almost 10 years ago, it was like the uh, only stent available. And the majority of the cardiologists were doing, uh, were putting the uh, cypher stent. Uh, uh, the bad thing about the stent is that we need to give the DAPT for almost like long because the stent is creating so much problem, the thickness of the stent strut and the generation, it was the older generation, uh, the risk of stent thrombosis is very high with that, which is not there with the newer generation stents. And uh, luckily, we can stop the DAPT uh, even after three months in some patients uh, with the newer generation stents. So that is the main advantage uh, of the newer generation stents over the older generation stents. Okay, the next question is which antiplatelet in alcoholic cirrhosis? Okay, so I would say in alcoholic cirrhosis, it is very difficult to manage uh, with the antiplatelet. Uh, Ideally, we can give clopidogrel, which is having, which is more uh, gastric fibrin, like uh, I would say less gastritic or other GI breeding uh, effect with the clopidogrel. Uh, but more important thing is in the cirrhosis patient, uh, esophageal varices and the platelet count. These two things we need to always consider because uh, whenever there is a bleeding from the esophageal varices, it can be, it can be massive sometimes. And uh, if the patient is on antiplatelet, that will be very difficult to manage. But yes, for the cardiac indication, we can safely give Ecosprin or the clopidogrel. Preferably, I would like to give clopidogrel uh, in those patients. Okay, so next question. Okay, so what is self antiplatelet in case of recurrent GI bleeding in patients undergone PTCA with stenting and how long? So just now we discussed uh, about that, that uh, uh, clopidogrel will be better uh, with the uh, slightly better uh, GI beneficial effect. And uh, for the stenting, after stenting, uh, at least three months of the DAPT is required. If there is a massive bleeding, we have to stop uh, in between. But yes, if there is a high risk for the bleeding, we can stop the DAPT after the three months. Okay, dual anti thrombotic drugs therapy is an accepted standard in A patients undergoing PCI. If aspirin is contraindicated, which two drugs you recommend? Okay, uh, regarding the atrial fibrillation, we need to give the oral anticoagulation and that is one of the uh, warfarin or acetron uh, that oral anticoagulant we need to add along with the aspirin and the clopidogrel. But if the aspirin is contraindicated or even in the atrial fibrillation patient, we don't give aspirin after a certain period of the time, let's say after six weeks. So we can put those patients on the clopidogrel and the uh, oral anticoagulation, either warfarin or acetron. Or even nowadays, they can recommend and they, they are uh, off level indication of the newer anti coagulant uh, drugs like Rivaroxaban and Epixaban kind of thing. So that we can combine with the clopidogrel when we come to the aspirin, we should not give it triple therapy uh, beyond certain period of the time. Okay, so the next question is sometimes we come across no reflow syndrome after PCI. Uh, to be free antagonist, even IV is said to be helpful. What is your experience? There's an excellent question. And actually, it is really helpful. Like in nowadays, it is a, it is like on table we need to decide to give the GP2 with few inhibitors. Specifically, what I recommend or what we usually follow is that to give those patients with the severe slow flow or knee, uh, no flow because of the high thrombotic burden in SES patient in SS situation. Uh, second important indication is to give it a stent thrombosis when the thrombus burden is very high. But yes, it is it is really helpful. Uh, along with the DAPD in no reflow syndrome after after PCI when there is a high thrombus burden. And we give it routinely for 24 to 48 hours or even sometimes intracoronary uh, after the PCI when there is a no reflow. Okay, next question is Have you ever experienced aspirin resistance? How clinically anyone suspect aspirin resistance? Yeah, so again, a good question. Uh, Aspirin resistance as well as the clopidogrel resistance is very common. Uh, I would say they say up to 30% of the population, uh, in Asian population, this kind of scenario can be can can present. Uh, 
So, as an interventional cardiologist, nowadays we don't recommend or we don't give it uh, clopidogrel grill uh, in the post uh, PCI patients. Usually, we give the picagrel and the prasugrel because we don't want this kind of resistance in our practice. Uh, the good thing, clinically, how to find that thing is that we can see the patient on already on the S3 and having recurrent ischemia. Let's say recurrent MI or recurrent unstable angina. That means those kind of patients might have aspirin resistance, and uh, we can switch over the pa uh, patient from aspirin to some other uh, antiplatelet agent, or preferably the newer antiplatelet agent. Okay, so the next question is how often clopidogrel resistance? Again, the same thing. Genetic study should be done. Okay, yeah, it's a very good question. There are few genetic studies available. Uh, but it is really costly in the clinical scenario. We usually, as I mentioned you before, that we don't usually do the genetic study to look for the tropical resistance because we have the newer anti platelets agents available like Pasugram and the Kikagura, which are excellent and uh, uh, which usually overcomes the uh, drawback of the tropical resistance. Okay, so is there any role of reducing dose of Kikagura to half the dose? after six months in a case of elective non-emergent PCI with favorable coronary anatomy. Guys, I, I recommend, I, I would tell you that there is no nothing like reducing dose to half with the ticagrod prior to the surgery or even the routine dose. Uh, it has to be stopped uh, three to five days, preferably five days prior to the surgery when it is a high surgery, high bleeding risk for the surgery. And uh, uh, after six months, uh, not like that, but after one year, we can reduce to 60 milligram twice daily uh, based on certain uh, clinical evidence uh, in the patient with the high risk of the ischemia in the future. So, uh, reducing half dose of the ticagrelor after six months is not at all indicated and it is not uh, generally uh, uh, recommended in any of the guidelines. Okay, I think this will be the last question. Are there any indication for the BM stand, bare metal stands? Okay, very good. So. Uh, uh, with the clinical recent, uh, latest uh, development in the stent technology, I think there is very few indications for the bare metal stents. I would say. Uh, specifically, we use it very rarely, first of all, but we use it when there is a high risk for the bleeding. And we need, we don't, uh, and the patient cannot tolerate the DAPT for the longer duration. So, in this situation, we can use the bare metal st uh, stent. Otherwise, uh, in routine clinical scenario, it will be, I would say, less than 1% or less than 2%. Uh, uh, all over the PCI happened all over the world, uh, bare metal stains are used. Okay, and then one more question, okay, let's go with that. Is there any subset of the patient who are at high risk of bleeding with picagrelol, like those with body weight less than 60? Oh, good question. So I think you have asked this question in perspective of the prasugrel. Uh, we can't give the prasugrel when, or it's a contraindication or the bleeding risk is high. When prasugrel is given to the patient with the weight less than 60 or the prior history of the TIA or straw, uh, it is not the, the same thing with the ticagrelor. You can safely give those patients ticagrelor because there is no such contraindication with the ticagrelor. It is very safe and no bleeding, uh, extra bleeding risk uh, with the ticagrelor in this situation. Okay, so I think we have done all the questions. Uh, so. I hope you all you all have enjoyed the uh, this academic vista and the webinar, and uh, we'll come up with the more webinar with the doc lectures in the future. Thank you for joining with.